Hi, I'm Jason Vienna, Executive Director of The Open Door here in Egan. And so the history of hunger in Egan and Dakota County, I mean, it's as long as Egan and Dakota County have been here. I mean, hunger has always unfortunately been a part of our society. I think with the creation of The Open Door back at Mount Calvary Church in 2004 and now as a standalone organization, We've done a lot of work to bring hunger into the limelight or into the forefront to make sure that everyone realizes there's as much hunger in the suburbs as there is in the inner city. It just looks a little bit different. So hunger has always been here, but thanks to the support of the Egan Foundation, we've done a much better job of addressing hunger, whether it's in neighborhoods, senior living facilities, or in our local schools. So hunger, it's always been here, but together we're making it a little bit better. So the biggest challenges that we're facing right now um, are the challenges that most of us are facing in our lives. I mean, we're, we're learning to adapt to a, a whole new environment. Our organization has changed our model of distribution three times in the past year. But in the biggest sense, our greatest challenge right now is making sure that we scale the operation to meet the increased demand in a way that we can scale it down when hopefully the economy begins to recover. And the other challenge that we face, our, face right now is making sure that we're getting food as safely as we can into all the places where it's needed. And so the work that we've done in this past year has really been addressing those things. And it's remarkable to think that we have grown to two to three times our normal scale, but I think we've done it in a way that's made food safer to access for so many in a way that as we hopefully improve, we can scale back down to a normal size. How does hunger impact the community at large? Well, I mean, I think all of us know from a, a real basic level that when you don't eat well, you don't do anything well. And so that's the evident part. But what I think people miss is when you find yourself struggling to have enough money for food in your house, you're still going to eat. So one of the biggest impacts in our community is access to healthy food. Because if you've only got so much money, you're gonna make trade-offs. And the health of our community and the productivity of our community really suffer when we don't make sure everyone has access. So whether that's students, whether it's employees, whether it's your colleagues at work, you need that healthy base to do everything better. So we know that it's not just about fighting hunger, it's about improving the overall health of Egan and all of Dakota County. And that's why we work so hard and why we so much appreciate the help of the Egan Foundation making healthy food a reality for pretty much everyone in our community that needs it. You know, trying to put into context how hunger you know the hunger relief community has been impacted by covid i mean that's it, it's been massively impacted i mean we are looking at levels of folks in our community that need help with hunger and access to food that are unparalleled in our generation uh and so the the great news of that is with the help of all the folks in the community that have supported the open door we've been able to scale up to that response but just from our organization in Egan and serving Dakota County, last year we had over 31,000 people come to the open door who had never been to the open door before. And so that speaks to the remarkable number of people in our community that found themselves in need of support, which hadn't. And I think that's really what we thought would happen at the beginning of the pandemic. We knew we had to make room because thinking about the context of hunger, all the hunger relief space, whether it's food shelves or food banks, before the coronavirus, we were all full. You know, we didn't have a lot of extra appointments. And so the work of the past year has been doing things in a, obviously in a safe manner, like every other part of our life, but also finding a way to make room for all the folks who had never been in this position before. And we, we think that's probably going to continue well into the future, because as we all know, these economic recoveries never happen as quickly as the spikes do. So the challenge of the pandemic has, has been remarkable, but I also wanna point out that in, in crisis, there's always opportunity and the opportunity for the open door has been the chance to try new things, to welcome in over 800 new volunteers in the past year and to find creative ways to get food where, where it's never been met before. So you think about our, our summer meal program, the mobile lunchbox this past year, thanks to the generosity of the community, we increased that program by 14 fold. We had never served more than 4,000 meals in a summer. And last summer we served 58,000 meals. Six of those neighborhoods were in Egan and we did 18 neighborhoods overall. So it's it's been a real mixed bag of horrible impact, but great opportunity and great stories of people coming together to do remarkable things. 
you know, thinking about what the future looks like for hunger relief, for the open door and for all the partners in our area, you know, because to be clear, the open door, we don't do anything by ourselves. We have great partnerships with folks. And so you think about all the different points of access in our community for hunger. Looking into the future, I don't anticipate a lot of change in demand over the coming year. So whether it's someone going to Lowe's and Fishes to pick up dinner, whether it's coming to the open door for groceries, whether they're getting home deliveries for Meals on Wheels, I think the number of folks that have been impacted by this pandemic are unfortunately going to stay steady for the next year. We hope that it's a, a gradual um, you know, relinquishment of need over time, but what we hope is that as, as the vaccines get out in the community more, we're able to reintroduce more of the choice and the interactions. Because, you know, in all the numbers of hunger relief, regardless of program, one of the things that's no doubt been lost, not just in your life, but in our business, is that relationship piece and the ability to have conversations. And so while food has been distributed at, at massive amounts, never before seen in the last 20 to 30 years, we all are very mindful that we, just like you, we've lost that chance to chat and to visit and to be in a space with each other because hunger isn't just about food, it's about dignity and it's about relationships. And so we hope that the next year, even though the scale may remain large, we really look forward to re-engaging with the clients that we work with, with our neighborhoods, so that we can do more than just have a transaction, that we can get back into that relationship with folks. And so. Um, I just look forward to all of you helping us do it. So, Good afternoon. My name is Madeline Kaffler and I work with Dakota County Social Services. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak about housing and homelessness in Dakota County and Egan. Homelessness in Dakota County has been on the rise over the past decade. In response, we've grown our services for people through our work with wonderful community partners like Dakota Woodlands, The Link, Wilder Foundation, 360 Communities, Matrix, and the Dakota County CDA. Together, we provide services like street outreach, drop-in centers, shelter, housing, rental assistance, and housing stability services. Most recently, Dakota County has been increasing shelter capacity. Before the pandemic, Dakota County had year-round family shelter with Dakota Woodlands and seasonal overnight shelter for single adults with Matrix Housing Services. As we collectively realized how dangerous COVID was, Matrix worked with a local hotel and moved 40 people from a congregate shelter in a church to individual rooms in a hotel last April, rather than shutting down for the season. This significantly increased people's safety overall and reduced the spread of COVID. Since then, we have expanded the hotel shelter program from 40 rooms to 110 rooms, partnering with Matrix, The Link, the CAP agency and ally supportive services to provide shelter and keep people safe. We also initiated an eviction prevention program using federal CARES funds. In 2020, our team paid over 2,300 rent and utility payments to area landlords and utility companies. This program helped tenants get current on rent and avoid the possibility of eviction. It also helped area landlords who were owed rent, sometimes by multiple tenants. Egan landlords received over $640,000 through this program last year. Dakota County in partnership with the state and other Metro partners will have another eviction prevention program opening up in the coming weeks. Despite this increase in capacity and programming, Dakota County residents are suffering from housing instability in greater numbers than before. Rents are increasing and wages are not keeping pace. This slide shows common wages for different professions in Dakota County and how much somebody should pay for rent given their income. For an apartment to be affordable, a family should pay no more than 30% of their income toward rent and utilities. A child care provider making $11.15 $11 15 per hour and working full time should pay no more than $580 per month in rent. However, an average two bedroom unit is over $1,000 per month. Rents are increasing at a faster pace than wages, making this gap bigger and bigger each year. People who have lived their whole lives in Dakota County are finding themselves priced out and businesses who need workers are having a harder time finding people who can afford to work for available wages who also live in the community. Exacerbating this are massive income disparities between white households and households of color in Dakota County. The median income for white households is $89,000 and for black households is $55,000. 
This is a difference of $34,000 per year. Additionally, black households are more likely to be renters than white households in Dakota County, reducing the amount of wealth and equity a family is building over time. These wealth gaps and large systemic disparities are things that we all have a responsibility to understand and influence. And until then, we will see disproportionate numbers of renters and people of color at extreme risk of housing instability and homelessness. While the future is uncertain, it can look bright if we come together. We need to work together to support and advocate for the creation of deeply affordable housing. We need to encourage rental property owners to continue taking rental assistance to help offset the gap between rent and wages. This will help people stay in our communities no matter what kind of job they have. We need to create more robust protections for renters as we learn about the positive impacts of the eviction moratorium while also ensuring access to rental assistance so that landlords can be made whole. And we need to continue our journey towards racial and social justice by eliminating things like massive income disparities. If we do this together, we can ensure that everyone has a safe and affordable place to call home in Egan and Dakota County. Thank you very much for all the good work you do to make Egan a welcoming place for all residents. Hi everyone, I'm Paul Maloney with Treehouse. Treehouse is on a mission to end hopelessness amongst youth offering mentorship and support groups in the community. And it's my job in Egan to collaborate with all the other youth serving organizations leading to the most collaborative holistic network of care that we can offer. Treehouse doesn't have an ego or believe that we're a one-stop shop for helping teens. So we make it our goal to partner additionally with other organizations that are doing an awesome job in other areas. We can make an awesome network of care by combining our efforts with, for example, Dakota County Social Services for referrals for our mentorship program, NAMI for suicidal awareness and safe practices, 360 Communities for group supports, and Minnesota Mental Health for counseling, loaves and fishes for meals, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to stress and emphasize that this takes a village. So I grew up here in District 196, and after serving on the Dakota County Local Advisory Council for Children's Mental Health, I can point out what we've been working on and how things have perhaps changed. Growing up, there was a, kind of a big negative stigma around mental health issues. Most of my peers didn't want to be seen going to counseling or to even admit that they were struggling with depression, or a lot of them even knowing that what they were struggling with was depression, mostly because we didn't understand what it truly was or what to even say to our friends who were struggling with it. But now after seeing the Minnesota student survey, we, we know that 32% of our females who are in 11th grade reporting feeling depressed a significant amount of their time. If we're a teen who is scared to talk about something we're struggling with or fear it will have a negative impact on our lives, we're less likely to talk about it and we're less likely to get help. And feeling safe to talk about something with our peers or caring adults will help save teens lives. As a youth service provider, our biggest challenge is what the teens biggest challenges are. And I can speak to what our teens are currently struggling with. Going back to that Minnesota State student survey, 46% of males and 61% of females in eighth grade reported being bullied. And that was from the 2019 survey. So that was pre COVID. And around, and also during pre COVID, around one third of all teens surveyed reported struggling with anxiety. Um, and that's really, really high. So, what this means for any youth and youth workers or care providers is that there's a lot of work to be done. And this is our ask right now for involvement and help. We need a lot of help. A lot of people are hurting. And this is just a student survey. I would love to see what it looks like for adults in the area too. So how does this impact the community at large? We were wondering the same thing. What happens to our, our teens once they graduate high school? What kind of things do they face? What kind of things do they go through? They don't have direct uh, contact with teachers a whole lot anymore. So we created our own survey for our alumni and asked them open-endedly, what types of things were they surprised by when they graduate? What things are they struggling with since they graduated? And how did uh, any preparations they were given help them for the future? And what we found out was that tied for first place 
that economic struggles and housing instability were the number one hard issues in their lives. We didn't wanna just learn this information and do nothing about it. So we started something called Treehouse Next. It's our transitionary program focused on helping our older youth learn necessary skills to help them land a job, get housing, budgeting, uh, interview, even find uh, career aptitude tests, uh, practice ACTs, anything that they would need to get um, any independence towards adulthood, even doing helping them with driver's ed courses and getting them signed up for that. So we want to strongly encourage any other organization that's serving kids who are working on grad graduating high school to create a transitionary bridge for them to get healthy relationships in adulthood. Once you leave high school, things can get a lot of uh, can get scary. You know every single year in school what you have coming the next year. As a freshman, you know what next year will be a sophomore. As a sophomore, you know next year I'll, I'll be a junior. Well, after high school, it's all up in the air. It's whatever. It's it's kind of up to you at that point. And giving the preparations up till now, a lot a lot of us end up struggling. All right. So how has the pandemic impacted our community? Well, Dakota County had 911 calls, nearly double in two categories, crisis, mental health, and welfare checks. Uh, they also saw a huge rise in family instability and requests for residential placement. But need is the creator of invention, and we're finding all sorts of ways to keep program going. Schools with distance learning, um, and then Treehouse even used a lot of virtual meeting platforms so we could continue offering mentorship five days a week to those who are struggling with isolation and thoughts of hopelessness. I struggle myself as an adult feeling isolated during the pandemic, working from home, not seeing anybody, not being able to, to see family. And we want to be able to get help to those who need it the most. Virtual high fives and hugs are not very fun and uh, we all need that personal impact of other, others who love and care about us. So what does this look, look like for the future for us? Well, I don't have the exact answer for that, but I do have the age-old wisdom of it takes a village. One of our partners shared that in their own research, they found that in order for a young person to have the best chances of success, they need seven loving and caring adults to personally invest in their lives. If we combine both school and perhaps a healthy family scenario at home, we're still only halfway there. This means that community members need to become some of the biggest encouragers for young people to stand in the gaps. And for me, I believe to whom much is given, much is required. And I'm trying my hardest to use the advantage that I've been given to give those who are struggling a fair chance. Everyone has something to offer. Don't think you don't have anything to offer. Everyone has either a network or a skill or a connection or an encouraging word, something they can do that can give back to the community. Please get involved with something. I have yet to hear of a local organization that has a problem of too many volunteers. It does take everybody. I, I learned at Treehouse, I don't have to necessarily be able to relate to be able to love. And love is a choice and I can choose to do my best to, to be there for our young adults as they go through all things. People did that for me growing up and that really taught me how to do it. And as a result of people investing in me, I'm investing in others now too. So we wanna say uh, from Treehouse and all the Treehouse youth and all the other folks that we partner with, we greatly appreciate the Egan Foundation for even taking the time to ask us what's going on in the community, what are you hearing, what are you learning and what can we do about it? Thanks again. Hello, I'm Julie Anderson, Recreation Supervisor for Egan Parks and Recreation. I oversee the visual art programs for the Egan Art House, which include classes, exhibits, outreach, events, and public art. I'm coming to you from our pottery studio, which has remained operational during COVID. We are less than 50% capacity, but we've stayed open to be a place of creativity and expression during this past year. We've also been a refuge and a source of calm for all of us trying to navigate through the stress of a global pandemic. Egan Art House and the arts organizations funded by the Egan Community Foundation are part of a 
2.167 billion, billion with a B, statewide economy, according to a 2019 study. To break it down, it's a $57 million impact in Dakota County, and in Egan, nearly $5 million of economic impact, including 105,000 audience members who spent nearly $3 million on events and activities in 2018. That's revenue that otherwise would not have been in our community. The arts do make a difference here. In addition to Egan Art House, there are six nonprofit arts organizations in Egan. They provide music, theater, public art, festivals, artist space, exhibitions, all avenues for the community to connect to creativity and to each other. Capone Art Park was here from the very beginning, over 30 years ago. The Egan Art Festival and Egan Art House wants one organization have a 25 year history in Egan with the last 16 years as separate organizations working together to serve the community. Artworks is the newest kid on the block, incorporated five years ago, answering the need for artist studio and gathering space south of the river. So what are some of the challenges arts organizations are currently facing? I've worked in the sector for many years. I've seen lots of ups and downs. The ups are always, for me, seeing the impact that the arts have on individuals, friendships, a sense of belonging and safety, seeing new perspectives and learning, always, always learning. The challenge for us, well, that's staying relevant. How do we as arts providers authentically connect to community whose voice is not being heard? Who needs to be at the table? How does this impact programming, budgets, staffing, boards? How can we work together as arts organizations to ensure a relevant and sustainable creative community? So what does the future look like for the arts in Egan? Over the past 12 months, most arts programs in Egan were shut down completely or significantly reduced. But our future is bright as we reemerge, having learned new service delivery options that increase overall accessibility to the arts, like virtual classes, take home boxes, online sales, virtual performances and exhibits. Our challenge now is to maintain and maximize what we've learned in the past year and reignite our past successes and combine it all for future community impact. The work of these arts organizations, and most importantly, the people involved with these organizations, is what makes Egan not just livable, but lovable. Congratulations to the arts organizations funded today, and thank you to the Egan Community Foundation for your continued support of the arts in the Egan community.